We started in Launceston, made our way to Devonport, travelled east to Coles Bay, found our way to Hobart and then on to Franklin. Along the way, we've met some amazing people and tasted some of the finest libations Tassie has to offer. But we're not done yet. I'm Yasmin Firkins and you're watching Last Drinks Tasmania. Departing the beautiful Huon Valley, we head north again, roughly 30 minutes from Hobart to the small town of Kempton. Here we're about to spend some time with two of Tassie's most beloved whisky producers. First, I've jumped in a four-wheeler and I'm heading to Belgrove Distillery to catch up with the man who started it all, Peter Bignall. Hi Peter, thank you so much for having us here. Oh, well, thank you very much for coming. And this is your rye field in your backyard? Yes, this is where the whole process starts. So I, I grow the grain, well actually it starts at the dirt. Yep. So I plant the seed, then yep. grow it to like this, and this is very nearly ready to harvest in, in January. And so we'll harvest this very shortly and put it away in a silo. Then over the next 12 to 18 months we can use it, or maybe you know, three or four years we can keep it. But, Unfortunately, it's not a particularly good yield this year, so we'll probably be able to use supply here. How many hectares of rye do you have? Um, we've got about uh, actually 20, about 25 hectares. Okay, and you wouldn't know how much that's produced. That's going to produce for you until you start harvesting. No, I don't know until I start harvesting. No. Right. So in a good year, how much would that produce? Well, I'm, I'm hoping I might get the rye is a very, very poor yielding crop. Um, but it, it, I'm hoping maybe five tonnes the hectare. But I suspect this year I might only get you know, two. Two. Mm. And you use it all just for your whiskey? That's all it's used for, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so how much whiskey would that produce? Yeah, well, um, basically, very roughly, a, a kilo of rye or a kilo of grain, of any sort of grain, will very roughly produce a bottle of whiskey. So one kilo of a very small seed, so that's obviously quite a lot of crop needed. Yes. To make one bottle of whiskey. Uh, yeah, yes. And, and what got you into whiskey? Um, well, this the rye did. Um, you know, since I was a teenager on the farm, we've been growing rye because, as you can see, it grows really tall, so uh -huh. it produces a lot of uh, a lot of um, feed for animals to eat, uh -huh. and just the grass part of it. Yeah. And so I mainly used to just grow it, grow it for the grass for to feed the animals money during the winter time, and then every few years we'd harvest a bit of seed off it to plant back in the ground again. And one year I had a, a really really good crop, harvested all the seed, and I thought oh, I'm going to sell it this time instead of just using it for myself and um, I couldn't find a buyer. Typically when you're farming you have a really good season and there's a glut. And right. um, so I suddenly thought, I oh, know, I'll build a whiskey distillery, it turned into whiskey then. That's, that's how it happened. And Belgrove Distillery was born. Yes. Belgrove Distillery was the first rye whiskey producer in Australia and is the only biodiesel powered distillery in the world. I've asked Peter for a tour and I get the feeling I'm about to learn a whole lot more about this unique distillery. I get the impression that Peter is an inventive man. Even retired household goods seem to have a use. It's an old clothes dryer. It's an old clothes dryer yeah, yeah. and you use that to... So I've modified the timing and the motor speeds a little bit and I've put finer mesh in here so the grain doesn't fall through all the holes. But this is, this is the rye that we saw up in the paddock. Yep. So once the grain's all bashed out of that, we load some of the dry grain into here. And then on that door here, we've got a little sprinkler, a tiny little micro sprinkler. Yep. So several times a day, that'll turn on and it'll wet the grain and just turn over very slowly to make all the moisture nice and even. And then the, in about three days, the little grains have sprouted. So it had tiny little plants here with roots and little sprouts on them. Um, we have to stop it growing then. But, so what's happening as the plants start to grow, they are producing enzymes which turn that starch or that flour into sugar yes. very, very slowly. So the little plant's got energy to get up out of the dirt. So once it's grown a little bit, we've got the enzymes and we've got a bit of sugar and we've got to stop it. So it is a clothes right. dryer, so mm -hmm. we just could pump hot air through it, turn it up to tumble dry speed. But that takes several days and a lot of energy. Yeah, so okay. what we do, as soon as it's sprouted enough, there's two things we can do. We can smoke it. So this old gas cylinder, we load some peat in there yeah. or even sheep dung in there. 
and burn it and smoke comes out of here we push that into here and turn it up to tumble dry speed so the wet grain tumbles through the smoke and the smoke sticks onto the grain. That's how we end up with smoky or peaty whisky. With sheep poo? With oh, usually oh. peat but occasionally sheep poo, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, interesting. And then so once you've done this process? Yes, yes. So once that's once it's once we've either got a smoked or unsmoked, whatever, yeah. then then we, we grind it up. So, okay. so we've just got an old meat mincer over here. So we grind it up in the old meat mincer. And so okay, that basically you know. releases all the enzymes and the sugars. Yeah. And why do you use a meat mincer? Um, I've tried a few different things to, to do it with and I found that the meat mincer works well on when it's wet grain. Whereas your traditional grist type mills that normal distilleries would use, they yeah. get all blocked up with the wet soggy grain. So the meat mincer works beautifully. Now it's time for Peter to show me how his rye whiskey gets made. Okay, so now, now we're in what, what we're calling the mash house. Uh -huh. So this is where we make beer. So, okay. so then we turn that beer into whiskey. So what we do, we've got a little grist mill. That, 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 that malt that we made in the clothes dryer, that's only about 20% of the grain. Okay. The other 80% of the grain is not malted. In this case, the type of whiskey I make, which is quite like the traditional Irish whiskey, the pot steel whiskey. Right. So there's 80% of it not malted. So we crush the grain. We've got, got some little bit of crushed grain here. So it's crushed up like this now. Okay. So this is just, um, in this case it's barley. It wasn't, wasn't rye this lot. But, um, so we just crush it up like this. It hasn't been malted. So then we'll, we'll cook that and basically turn that into barley porridge or rye porridge. Yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. th behind us we've got this big uh, stainless steel insulated tank. So we fill those up with boiling water. So we've got a burner at the back that runs on, on waste oil. It usually waste cooking oil from the roadhouse just, just outside the gate. Oh, okay. Yep, so then we fill it up with boiling water. Then we dump that, that crushed grain in there and cook it in, just in its own heat. And it makes a really big, thick porridge. Right. And then we've got to turn that porridge into whiskey. I hope you're taking notes. Yep, so, the, so the next step, um, we'll, leave, we'll leave that, um, that, that mash in, in this tank overnight and it goes sour. Okay. Because on the grain that hasn't been malted, there's a lot of lactobacillus and that turns, makes lactic acid, which uh -huh. is similar to when you're making yogurt, yep. but that preserves the mash and stops it going, going off. Um, but then more importantly, that lactic acid will react with alcohol. So it's a little bit of you know, wild yeast in there making alcohol. So we come in here in the morning and it smells like we're making fruit salad yogurt. Right. It's got sour note from the yep. lactobacillus and there's lovely fruity notes from the esters that are being formed. Yeah. So then we'll, we'll drain that out through this thing called a belt press which is a filter cloth that goes through rollers and we squeeze all the lovely sweet juice, the wort, out of it. Yep. And then the solids, they get scraped off the belt into a trailer and which feeds the sheep. Okay. So we don't waste anything. No, not at all. Yeah. And what about, these are some pretty big barrels. They're pretty big barrels. They're not, not for storing whiskey in, no. they're, for, they're fermenting in. Okay. Yeah, so that sugary juice, that wort, then we cool it down to a temperature where the yeast like to work. They pump it into, into one of these vats and then add some yeast to it, and then it bubbles away for anywhere between five and eight days, depending on the time of year. Okay. And, and basically made a beer. Yeah. The only difference with this is that uh, your normal pub beer, um, that wort, that sugary juice is boiled and add hops to it. We're yeah. just making whiskey, we just skip that step. Yeah. yeah. So after it's been in here for five to eight days, into the... We've made a sour beer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then we, we'll pump that into the still. Okay. And boil it, yes. Stick around because after the break, I think I'm about ready to do some tasting. Okay, we're ready for the fun part. This is the fun part. You have quite a few different varieties of whiskey. We're going to try just a couple. Yes, yeah, I've got a lot of varieties because Look, I just love being creative and I get bored very easily. So yep. I just got to keep on making new stuff, experimenting and playing all the time with different flavours. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What so have what, you got for me? When we saw the still, the, the clear spirit comes off the still. We, we do bottle this, but it mainly goes into cocktails. Most people would much rather the aged whisky. So after it's been in the uh -huh. barrel for several years, that's this one. Yep. So this particular one is a, a vatting of five different barrels, just so we get a more consistent flavour. Very occasionally we'll get a barrel that tastes really, really nice, so we'll do that as a single barrel bottling, that's called. Right. But most of them, we, we blend a whole lot of barrels together. So if you want a little taste of this one. Yes. It's, um, you can smell the grain. Yes, yeah, Quite yeah. like earthiness to it. Yeah, because there's, a lot of the grain just hasn't been malted, so it changes the flavour okay. when you malt it. 
So that's, it's about 80% of the grain is not malted, so we get so much more of that natural grain flavours through, so the rye. And rye is a very yeah. distinctive note too. It's, it's rye bread. A lot of people say they can actually yeah. smell the rye bread in yeah. there. I personally can't, but a lot of people say they do. Yeah, what do you pick out there the first that hits you? The grain, you said? The grain, slightly smoky. Is yes, that so? Not... That's, that's smoking. This is, this is not peated? Yeah. There's no peat being used on the grain at all. That comes from the still, that little bit of scorching in the, and that Maillard reaction in the bottom of the still gives that little smoky note. Quite a bit of sweetness to it as well. Yes, yeah, so it's yeah. amazing. You get intense sweetness and bitterness at the same time yeah. on sort of different parts of your tongue. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, that's quite sweet. quite different from malt whiskey. Yeah, and it's yeah. smooth, very smooth. Yeah. So the next next one, just for something yeah, quite different, we've uh, got an oat whiskey. Okay. Yeah, so this is mainly oats that I grew here on the farm. So all okay. the whiskey I make here, it is with grains that I actually grow here on the farm. Okay, so, so it still have... has rye in it? Yes, or, yes. Yeah? So there's four different grains in this, but the main the main grain is oats. That tastes very different to the rye whiskey. Yes, sure. it, 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 it's, it's a lot, lot sweeter. It's a little bit more like a malt whiskey. Um, it, it, there's only a tiny bit of rye in it, so it doesn't bring that spicy bitterness in there very much, but no. it does add to the complexity of it. It's, it's quite a lot higher alcohol, so you might want to put a little drip of water in there to, to um, yeah, calm it down a little bit and yeah. make it a bit better mouthfeel and it changes the flavours a bit, even just a couple of little drips of water I'll makes a big difference. More. Whiskey. <laughs> should try it with some water. <laughs> Before we taste another drop, Peter thought he'd show me his 11 year old still. I wonder why. This looks like a bit of a older still. How long have you had this one for? Yeah, so I, I, I built this 11 years ago when I first started here. Right, you built it yourself? Yes, yeah, I built it right, right there where it is. It looks well used yes, as well. It, yes, it was lovely and shiny. I think we spent more time polishing it than building it recently <laughs> than, than I let it go. So it's, um, and it's it, copper? It, it's copper, yes. yes yeah, copper's really important for distilling, yeah. um, especially uh, wine that might have a little bit of sulphur in it, which I do make brandy from time to time, uh, but also grain has got a little bit of sulphur in it. Uh -huh. and the sulphur reacts to the copper and turns it to copper sulphate and other copper compounds that don't smell and don't taste anymore. Okay. So apparently stills built out of stone still can make whiskey that tastes like turnips. Somehow, I don't think there's a huge market for turnip whiskey. Okay, back to the tasting. Now and again, I smoke the grain with, with peat. Uh -huh. That comes from behind my brother's house, so I'm very, very self-sufficient in almost everything I have here. Yeah. But, um, and I also, I smoke it with burning sheep dung. So I've got a shearing shed just behind the distillery here and we, we shovel sheep dung out, dried sheep dung, which um, Gordon Ramsay was here a year ago. Yeah. Had him down in the shearing shed there shoveling sheep shit from underneath the shearing shed <laughs> <laughs> and, so, we, and we burnt it yeah. and the smoke from that, we smoked the, the wet grain. So this is sheep poo whiskey? Well, it's sheep poo smoked whiskey. Sheep poo there's smoked no, whiskey. There's no sheep poo in it, but yes, <laughs> there's some, some of the smoke from burning it. All right. So, this is the first. Yeah. So sheep, bur burning sheep dung is very similar to burning peat because it's both, it's vegetation that has been broken, partly broken down in an acid and um, oxygen free environment, which is a sheep stomach or a swamp. Okay. Just a sheep stomach does it a lot, lot quicker than a swamp does. Right. Mm. So very similar. Oh, this smells... Very different, yes. Lovely. It doesn't smell like poo. It certainly doesn't, <laughs> no. If anyone was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> It is pretty scarce. This, this batch is sold out, but there's, there's several barrels there that are maturing away at the moment. And it's great. It's such a lovely story. I'm going to do a lot more of it in the future. Yeah, that smokiness is beautiful. You're talking about strong smokiness. There's, there's another bottle here that's... Um, I think, think that's not, not it. Sorry, that's... Um, this, this one here, the, the Bogan Burnout. Bogan Burnout. So if you like smoky whiskey, that is for you. But it is very, very smoky. It's my, it's my attempt at making the smokiest whiskey in the world. And I've had it analysed and it is, it is right up there. But if, if you don't like smoke, you will not like it at all. <laughs> it's 
like um, licking a chimney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In whiskey form, it's smoky. Smoky, yes. Yeah, yes. wow. Yeah. A, a, a good use for it is if you want to smoke, if you've got a whiskey and you don't think it's smoky enough, you just tip a little bit of this, this into your whiskey to give it a lift. Yeah, it's almost a concentrate. And it's a different smokiness. Yes. It's not. It's not even a more intense smokiness of the previous ones. A completely different flavour of the smoke. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, this this smoke is peat. Okay. And, but to, look, every peat that makes a different flavour. You know, you get peats that go right near the coast where this is from, or you get Highland peats in Scotland, or you get Isla peats. You know, they're, they're all different. Give all different yeah. smoke notes. Yeah. And then the way you ferment them, and the way you distill them, and the way you barrel age them, it, it all changes. Yeah, so this will change. This is not not really ready to, for drinking yet. Oh, great! It's, Thank it's, you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but it, it'll settle down a little bit more, but not much. Okay. It, yeah. Yes. And is there a big market for that super smoky whiskey? Oh, there are some people out there who just cannot get enough. But I think when they get this, they'll find they've had enough. <laughs> I think you're right, Peter. Peter, thank you so much for having us here at the Belgrove Distillery. Oh, look, it's been a pleasure showing you around. I just, I just love showing people around and love showing people my creations and because that's what they are. Um, I, I'd get totally bored making one product. I just love making lots of things and just being creative. And there's no point in making these things unless other people can appreciate them. What a great sentiment. Belgrove Distillery is not only situated in an amazing part of the world, I think it's run by a pretty brilliant man. But we can't stick around too much longer as we have a short drive to the other side of town where I'm heading to the old Kempton Distillery, situated inside a very historic and potentially haunted building. Hi Erin. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. You are the cellar door manager at Old Kempton Distillery. I am, I am. You get to work in this beautiful house. I do. It's uh, the first time I walked in um, it was all shut up and they hadn't opened yet and it was all dark and we heard piano music so we had ghosts straight up. Yep, it was amazing. So we have a piano now so it feels a bit less scary when I come into oh, it. there was no piano? There was no piano. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. so um, we all have a bit of ghost stories about the place but that was yeah. the biggest one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, um, it's an amazing house, amazing location. Um, the most comments we have from customers is just, wow, you get to be here every day. So, yeah. yeah. When was it built? 1842. Okay. Um, so it was an old coaching inn. It's also been a school uh, for girls only. Yeah. And um, they used to age spirit out the back in the back room, very illegally. So perfect place for a distillery. Ah, okay. It's a beautiful building, but I'm still thinking about the piano playing ghosts. This is our courtyard. So this is, I mean, like, are we in the Mediterranean? It's amazing, and it's always this one out here. <laughs> I know it's 29 today, which is weird for Kempton and Tasmania. Yeah. Um, but it it, is. it's always like this out here. So nice sunny, and warm. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Because the sandstone is it's stunning. amazing. So it's all original. Um, get repointed. Uh, the bells up there actually still work. So they go through the whole house, and you can ding them and call the staff, but they don't come. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, but it's all original sandstone flooring, um, a bit bumpy for that reason. <laughs> and yep. um, that's an old water tank. So they used to get all the, in the middle, they used to get all the water from all around the roofs and store it in there. So that's what they used for the baths and everything. Oh, wow. It was yeah. all in there. Yeah. Oh, cool. Now it's just a scary hole in the floor, but they kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Erin's trying to impress me or scare me, but either way, I'm ready for a drink. Along with its historic cellar door, Old Kempton Distillery is surrounded by beautiful flowers, trees and epic scenery. And so what was this building? So this was the stables. Oh, okay, so right, of everything original is still in here. Oh, so it's this, so cool. Yeah, good for whiskey. <laughs> so 22 horses it could hold. Um, and everything in here is original, so you can tell from the cobwebs we haven't touched anything. <laughs> Good for whiskey in here because it's always yeah, cool. It is <laughs> like 10 degrees cooler in it here is. than it is outside. And it's about minus 5 in winter. So yeah, great. you get the different temperatures which really helps the whiskey develop. Yeah. yeah. And you've got how many, would you say, barrels in here? 
There's a lot. There's so, a lot. So um, we've got a good mix. All the 20 litre barrels at the moment are private barrels. So okay. privately owned barrels. Um, yep. They're not investments. They actually take the barrel and the whiskey home at the end of the day. So oh, right. very lucky people. Yeah. <laughs> I hear there is quite a few tastings waiting for me. There is. We do whiskey, gin and liqueurs and we just want you to have a piece of all of it because Tazzy's amazing. So Great. I'm going to take you around to our distiller, Matt. Yep. Um, he makes all of it. He's yep. got all the knowledge. He's the best person to take you through it. Matt's the man. You're going to enjoy it. All right, let's, yeah, go. let's go. After a great tour of the grounds with cellar door manager Erin, it's time to tackle one or two of Old Kempton's gins with head distiller Matt. So this is a dry gin? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's very, okay. very prominent on juniper to begin with. Yeah. And then it follows through with citrus on the nose. It's, yeah, I'm very citrusy. It's a nice, neat gin, but it does go all through cocktails. So you, it would be as a standalone yeah. on its own, yeah. This one actually goes really nice with a Mediterranean tonic. Okay. So just a standard G&T is very nice with a twist of orange. Orange yeah. as your garnish. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So to finish off with the gin, we have the barrel aged that's been made and then it gets put into an ex whiskey cask. So currently we're using bourbon casks okay. for a little bit of sweetness. Uh, it takes up a little bit of colour, as you can see, and just a touch of whiskey flavour. So it's a whiskey drink as gin. A whiskey drink. And how long would it stay in the barrel for? Right now, three months is good. Okay. So not too long. Yeah, but it's still a bit of time. Yep. So it only goes in there for a little while just to take on a bit of colour and a bit of flavour yep. before the oak tannins start to come through and you get okay. that dryness. So you're just wanting to with, grab a little bit of flavour from bit. the barrel? Yep. Yep. This one will taste like it's a little bit stronger. It's not though. That's just the whiskey. Yeah, it just smells like yep. a light whiskey. Yep. So they're all 46% ABV. Yep. Before I taste some whiskey, I'm about to chat to the godfather of whiskey himself, the legendary Bill Lark. Bill, thank you so much for having us here. Oh, it's a pleasure, Yasmin. You are the, I've been told you are, the godfather of Australian whiskey. <laughs> well, some people call me that, yes. <laughs> and how did you get that title? I guess it stems from the fact that Lynn and myself, way back in the early 90s, um, wanted to see if Tasmania could make single malt whiskey. And we actually, through the help of a few federal politicians, managed to get the federal legislation changed to allow boutique distilling in Australia. And we ended up getting the first licence here since 1839 and arguably the first people to start making single malt whisky. And as you know, there are now over 70 distilleries in Tasmania and several hundred across Australia. So people started calling me the grandfather of Australian whisky and then uh, one day I was actually in Scotland helping set up a boutique distillery and the BBC did an interview and mistakenly referred to me as the godfather of Australian whisky. And it stuck. And it stuck. <laughs> so not only are you one of the founders of Old Kempton Distillery, you're one of the founders of Australian whisky. Yeah, look, and it's something that Lynn and I are very proud of, the fact yeah. that um, all we wanted to do was to see if we could make whisky. We had no intention of starting um, a business, let alone an industry. But the wonderful thing for us is that distilleries like Kempton and a lot mm -hmm. of the other distilleries are all producing world award winning whiskies, um, and that's yeah. really exciting and something we're very proud of. For something that was just going to be a, a little challenge or a hobby to see if you could do and you've grown it. Yeah, I'd, in fact I'd, I'm pretty sure we didn't even want it to be a hobby, we, it was a challenge. Yeah. It was simply to see if we could make good whisky in Tasmania. We figured the climate was okay, I don't know. Um, we knew we had good barley because our beers were winning awards and uh -huh. being exported all over the world. Everybody talks about Tasmanian water as being second to none. So um, we just said to ourselves, I wonder why nobody's making whiskey. Let's see if we can. That's how it started. And look at you now. And look, <laughs> yeah, be careful what you wish for, Yasmin. It just might happen. Well, what a special treat it was catching up with Bill. Now, back to Matt for some whiskey. So this is our Shiraz cask release. It is a cask strength whiskey, so that means that it's 60%. It's, it's very high in alcohol content. And this was our Christmas release, actually. Okay. The, the Goldilocks whiskey. True. 
creamy. It is? It's very creamy. It is, it's nice and creamy. Even just as is. Yeah. So it's not too bad. Um, it has been determined that 60% is approachable enough. Yeah. It's not too strong. Can I try it with some water? Yeah, of course. So. I like your little droppers. The droppers are very cute. Yeah. Um, they they go with each car strength release. So you can. Oh, you give one of these with the. With the releases, yeah. So you usually put two or three, okay. depending on your your pour size, and that just helps open up the whiskey and cut it back to a more approachable strength mm. for the individual. So the lavender malt. Tell me, how did we get to so, creating a lavender liqueur? This is made using Port Arthur lavender. And what we do is we take our malt spirit from the whiskey. So okay. it's a clear spirit before it goes into the casks. We use this spirit. We then steep the lavender heads yep. of Port Arthur in the spirit itself to extract that flavour and aroma. And then we sweeten it down to 33%. Okay. So this is a good one to, to finish with. It's nice on its own, chilled from the freezer. A uh, bit of ice even. Yeah after dinner sort of thing. And do you bed. put it in cocktails as well? It does go through cocktails. Yeah. So this one goes particularly well with the gin, so embezzler gin. Uh-huh. And it can be replaced if you're looking for a bit of lavender flavour as a simple syrup, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Because lavender is usually used to like sleeping and relaxation, mm. so like a night time it's a nice yeah, uh, dessert or after dinner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before bed sort of thing. And the lavender is strong. Mm. What about over some ice cream? Over some ice cream, it goes nicely. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, you for can... letting me taste your gins, your whiskies, the lavender liqueur. It's been great, so thank you for having us. No, you're very welcome. Thank you. I've got a gin with the lavender liqueur and I'm going to dig into this platter of beautiful Tasmanian produce. I've had so much whiskey and so much gin today, but now it is time to unwind and relax in this converted church in Kempton. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you check out our previous episodes of Last Drinks Tasmania, and I'll see you in the next one. Next week, our wonderful journey across Tassie comes to an end. To close out our trip, I take a visit to one of the country's most loved cideries, and we finish in historic Port Arthur for some wild and woolly whiskey.